W ranking, we need to make the WF ranking. So those will be a pre-processing function. Let's start with the husband list. So we, we've been given the wife list where you plug in a man index and it tells you who is that man married to. Now we want the same thing but from the opposite perspective where you can plug in uh, a woman's index. Like here we have husband W, you plug in the woman's index and they'll tell you who's her husband. So that's just a matter of inverting the, the, the wife list to get the husband list. So let's, let's do that first. That'll be a little bit simpler than the ranking. Let me just, it's going to be a list of like 10. Let me just initialize it to none, so then we'll move through and populate it. And the idea is if you walk through the wife list, position of the wife list that tells you who is this man married to. So then you'll just put that in the husband list saying that woman is married to this man. We've done this sort of thing before also, so remember just say for every man, now if I look up wife of M, what I want is that if I take that woman's index and plug it into the husband list, I should get man M back out. So husband of wife of M equals, there you go. That's inverting the wife list to get the husband list. So that takes care of the husband list, which we're not doing. We had to create it for ourselves. What about the MW ranking list? Similar thing where you just need to invert the permutation. If you look at each man's preference list, you need to invert it so that if you plug in a woman identification, uh, it'll tell you where was that woman on the list. It's the same sort of thing, but now we've got to have a loop where we do this for every man. We set up the ranking list. It's a two-dimensional list. I'll populate it with nuns. Remember, this is the Python syntax for creating a two-dimensional list. So n rows, n columns. We need to do it for each man, invert his preference list to his ranking list. So I'll say for m in range n. Now, to invert it, it's similar to inverting wife to get husband. We'll just walk through the list. For every position on the list, we'll see which woman is there, and then say, in the ranking list, if you plug in that woman, you should get that position, just inverting it. And we usually use R for this position in the, in the, list, in the preference list. So if you look up mancraft MR, that is the identity of the woman at position R on his list. So what you want is if you take that woman's index and plug it into the MW ranking, you should get R, because R is where that woman was. So if you say MW ranking M, and then if that woman's index, it should get, it should evaluate to R. That's where that woman was on the list. That's what we want ranking to be. In fact, this was just like in the stable matching algorithm, we needed the same thing. So you could basically just copy and paste it that little segment. But in the stable matching algorithm, we only needed it from the woman's perspective, and now we need it from both perspectives, man and woman. So I'll just copy and paste it again, and now we can change W and M. For each W, let's invert her preference list. So WM ranking, you give it the woman, and you give it the man at position R on her list. Then you plug that into the ranking, you see next week should give you R, because that's where that man was. I think that's everything. I'm just going to quickly run this, not dwell on it, because I've got a whole set of copies that are trying to get today. But just going to give statements, and then go back and add the two processing stuff at the beginning. That's the order in which I would choose to write the code. So that's all for that problem. Uh, the next one I wanted to illustrate was homework four, problem two. This was a bit of a tricky one. It's asking you to return true or false. Does there exist a cycle containing no pass? Um, I didn't ask you to write code for this one, but I'll illustrate it on the board. Uh, pictures like this are given an undirected graph G, and you're given some particular node in their pass. So you can this, this thing is the whole graph, and you've got some particular node that you've been given as an input. The goal is to figure out whether there exists a cycle, you know, something that looks like this, containing the node S. So it, it sounds like a VFS problem. It's kind of like saying, if you start at S, then 
could you do BFS to see whether you can reach S? Well, doing it in such a naive way isn't going to work, because if you just start at S, then BFS would tell you you're already at S. Of course, S is reachable from S. You need to kind of strip away the first step of BFS by considering all the neighbors of S. Look at each neighbor of S and then ask from that neighbor, can you get to S? Well, again, if you do that in a naive way, it will be... You know, imagine that's some neighbor of S and you say, okay, from this node, can you get to S? Then BFS is just going to say, yes, of course you can, using that direct edge. Well, that's not what you wanted. What you really wanted was, can you get from this neighbor of S to S without using that edge that directly connected them? If you can do that, then it's a cycle. So that's the whole algorithm, but you end up needing to be pretty careful about analyzing the running time. I'm just drawing an example here. Maybe S has degree 5. Degree is the number of nodes that are are neighbors of S. So if it looked like this, then the algorithm would be go through each of the neighbors of S and for each neighbor do a BFS to see whether you can get from that neighbor back to S without using the edge that directly connects them. So that would be run BFS from this node but pretending that this edge doesn't exist. If the BFS eventually finds S, then it's like this. You started there, follow the path to S without using the direct edge, so combine all together, that's, that's a cycle containing S. And you just try each of S's neighbors. So just to put some pseudocode here, I'll modify it a little bit, but the, the pseudocode is for each neighbor of S, let me call it U, we'll do a BFS, starting at node U, and ignoring the edge that directly connects U and B. Just pretend that that edge is not there in the graph, so the BFS won't just immediately say, of course you can get from U to S, just use that edge. Now you want to find another way to get to S. So just ignore that edge in the BFS. If you encounter F, then bingo, that's a cycle like in this picture. What I'm writing on the board here is just a slightly abbreviated version of what's in the model solutions. It'll return true. And so if there is a cycle, then there's got to be some neighbor of S that's on the cycle. So when you try that neighbor, the BFS will discover that you can complete the cycle. So if after trying all the neighbors you don't find a BFS that gives you another way to get around to S, then there just must not be a cycle. So after trying every single neighbor, if you still haven't found the cycle, this is a colon by the way, then it's safe to return false. That works, but the trickiest part about this problem was analyzing the running time. is to say each BFS takes big O of n plus m time, but you're running a bunch of BFSs, so that would multiply the BFS running time by the number of times you run it. So that would give running time big O of degree of S, let me abbreviate, deg of S times n plus m. So the n plus m is the running time of a single BFS and you're running it this many times. You do it once for each neighbor of S, so that gives you a factor of a degree of S, which could be quite large. So this may not be a linear time algorithm. Let me pause for, to remind you, why is the running time of BFS n plus m? Where does the n come from, first of all? If you remember how BFS works, you start by marking all the nodes as undiscovered. Well, you need n time just to do that. You have to create a list of size n that says for each node whether it's been discovered yet. And at the very beginning, none of the nodes has been discovered, so you need time n just to set up that list that says initially nothing is discovered. 
then as you do the VFS, each time you look at an edge, you have to see whether the other endpoint has been discovered, and if not, you mark it as discovered. So that's constant time per edge as you're doing the actual loop in the VFS. So you might have to process every single edge. Remember, n is the number of nodes, m is the number of edges in a graph. So you get an m in the running time because you might have to look at every edge and do something. Check whether the other endpoint is discovered. If not, mark it as discovered, put it in the queue. So that's where the m comes from. But the n at the beginning comes from, you, know, you, you have to say that all the nodes are undiscovered at the beginning. So that later on throughout the algorithm, you can check if it's, if it's still undiscovered as you marked at the beginning, then change it to discovered. So, okay, that's just a recap of why the running time of VFS is n plus m, where n is the number of nodes, m is the number of edges. Now, for this problem, you have this annoying factor of the degree of s. How do you get rid of that? The idea is, well, if you analyze things carefully, the factor of degree of s will actually disappear. Because if you imagine deleting S from the graph, it's going to split the graph into potentially a bunch of connecting components. Like it may be that from this neighbor of S, you can't reach any of the other neighbors of S. So if you deleted S, then you just have this com component floating out there. And maybe these two neighbors are in another component. So from one, you can reach the other, but deleting S would kind of separate out that component, and so on. So the problem of finding a cycle containing S is really just whether one of these components has two neighbors of S. If, if every one of these components looks like the upper left one that only has one neighbor of S, then there won't be any cycle containing S. But when you run VFS from a node, you, know, you stop once you hit S. So when you run VFS, it's only going to explore this component, the component that would result if you deleted S. So in this example, if you let me just pretend that uh, these are, let me make this into two components here, just to illustrate. So there are the upper three neighbors of S. If you run VFS from this neighbor, it'll explore all the nodes in that component, but it'll see it can't get anywhere else from there, so it hasn't discovered a cycle. Same thing here, if you move on to this neighbor, run VFS starting from there, and VFS will explore all the nodes that are in that component up there, but because there's no edge back to S, it'll just get stuck and won't find S. So, still no cycle. Try it again here, same thing, it'll explore all the nodes that are in that right component. Can't get back to S, so no cycle. Then you come down here, maybe try this U. Now the BFS will explore from here and eventually find that there's a path to this node, which then has an edge back to S, so bingo, it's found a cycle. Pay attention to what's happened here. The running time of each of these BFSs only depends on how many edges are in those components. So when you add them up over all the different neighbors, you're only going to get M. You know, you're not going to do the same edge more than once. If you did this, if you covered an edge from this neighbor and then later on you covered an edge after starting from this neighbor, that would mean that the neighbors were actually connected and you would have found a cycle. So since each edge only gets covered once, even though there are a bunch of BFSs, each edge will only appear in one of the BFSs. So you're only going to get a running time of M, even though it's a bunch of BFSs. So you could just think of it as being M1 is the number of edges here, M2 is the number of edges there, M3 is the number of edges there, but the running time would be, instead of degree of S times M, you would get M1 plus M2 plus M3, just... Um, so you don't need to multiply the degree of S by M, the only other thing to worry about is what about multiplying the degree of s by n? Well, the n only comes from initializing all the nodes as undiscovered. But that you only need to do once at the very beginning. You don't need to do that every single time you start a new BFS. So you just need to be a little careful. Take this part where you initialize all the nodes as undiscovered and factor it out of the neighborhood. So you need to have one more line of code here. I didn't quite leave myself enough space, but try to make it work. At the very beginning, you mark all nodes as undiscovered. So that gives you an N in the running time, but it's only once. It's not per BFS. So that factor of the degree of S goes away, and now you just have N plus M. So 
So that's how you solve that problem. The point is, after you run this PFS up here, you don't need to reset all the nodes as undiscovered because you'll just, you know, the ones in this component are still discovered, but just leave them that way, and all the other nodes are still undiscovered. There's nothing to reset. You don't need to do another order n something to reset thing. It's just leave it. So the, the n only occurs once at the very beginning, and the m is divided up among the different PFSs, so we can add everything together and still order n plus n. Questions about that one? That was the intended solution of uh, homework number four, problem number two. It's useful for representing prerequisite relationships. Like here, each node represents a computer science course, and the edges are prerequisite relationships. So if there's an edge from this node to that node, what it means is you have to take this course before you take that course. Like you have to take 1900 before you take 2150. This is a DAG, of course, if, if there were a cycle, then that would be a big problem. We'd never be able to need all the prerequisites. And topological order, remember, just means a way of ordering the nodes on the number line so that all the edges point from left to right. So that gives you an order that you could take the courses in to satisfy all the prerequisite relationships. If you took these nodes in this graph and put them on the number line somehow so that all edges went from left to right, and if you just take the courses in that order, you'll always be fine. You'll always have satisfied all the prerequisites needed whenever you take your next course because you took them earlier. But if you just do that, a topological order, that kind of suggests taking one course at a time. So this problem says, let's be a little more realistic. Let's assume you can take more than one course at a time, and you want to minimize the number of semesters needed to graduate. It's a little bit unrealistic because we're assuming here that you can take as many courses as you want at a time. All you care about is the number of semesters, not about your workload in each semester. But still, the idea is just a modification of this topological order algorithm. Let's have a reminder of what the topological order algorithm is. Given a day, how do you find the ordering of the nodes so that all the edges go from left to right? All you have to do is find a node that has in degree zero and put that first. We prove that every DAG has a node of in degree zero, at least one, possibly more than one. Just find a node that has in degree zero. No reason not to put that leftmost, put it first in the topological order. There are no incoming edges, so there's nothing to worry about there. And after you delete that node, it may cause some other nodes to have their in degrees drop down to zero. And if the in degree drops to zero, then it's safe to put that node next in the topological order and so on. So that's a review of the topological order and algorithm, and this is just a small modification of that where at the beginning, instead of just picking one node that has in degree zero and putting it first, you're going to find all the nodes that have in degree zero and do those courses in your first semester. That's all the courses that have no prerequisites at all. No reason not to take all those in the first semester. Then you conceptually delete all those nodes that represent a course that you just took. Delete those from the graph. That may cause other nodes to have their in degrees drop to zero. And then you find all the nodes whose in degrees are now zero, put those in the second semester. Because these are all the courses that don't have any prerequisites other than the courses you already took. And so on. Then you'll delete all those nodes. That causes the in degrees of other nodes to drop to zero. So you'll collect all those and put them as the third semester. That's safe to do because those are all the courses that don't have any prerequisites you haven't already taken. That's the idea for this problem, so I'll show you the Python code. It's very similar to the topological order code that we did in class. Here it is, I've got that example there. Usually with graph problems, probably the first line of code will just be grabbing the number of nodes and putting it in first, and, and the length of the adjacent field is not the number of nodes, so let's get that first. Now, once again, you have to be a little careful about how you implement this. The naive thing would be, say, okay, I got this great intuition. Each semester, I'll just find all of the nodes that have in degree zero, that after deleting the course wire, so find everything that has in degree zero, put those in the next semester. Well, how do you find all the nodes that have in degree zero? It would be a little inefficient to be just walking through the entire graph every single time, trying to find all the nodes that, that now have in degree zero. Instead, what we want is that at the beginning of a new semester, you've just already got the list of nodes that have in degree zero, and bam, you put those as your next semester and you move on. You don't want to have to be searching through the graph every single time trying to discover 
Are there any new nodes within degree zero? You want to maintain it as you go along. The idea for that, just like in the topological order algorithm, was you'll keep track of the degrees of all the nodes. So at the very beginning, we'll have a pre-processing phase where we get all the in degrees of nodes just to get things started. But as we go through the algorithm, whenever you delete a node, you look at all the edges coming out of the node, and the way you conceptually delete that node is by decrementing the in degrees of the other nodes that it has an edge to. If you delete this node, that means all the edges coming out of it are also gone, so that causes the in degree of its neighbors to go down by one. So in this way, you very efficiently maintain the in degrees of all nodes. You don't have to be recomputing things as you go along. You just maintain it. And whenever uh, you delete a node and it causes a, another in degree to drop, you check. If it drops to zero, then thing go. You don't need to go looking for nodes that have in degree zero. You just find them. As soon as the in degree drops to zero, you know, I'm going to take that course next semester because I'm taking its last three records of this semester. So the very first thing is get those in degrees before you even start the main loop of the algorithm. We're going to have a list that maintains the in degrees. So we've got n nodes, so we plug in i and it tells you what's the current in degree of node i. And at the very beginning, to populate this list, we just have to look through the entire graph and count up the in degrees. So let's loop through all the edges in the graph. There are n nodes, so we'll loop through all those, call it u, and then loop through all of u's neighbors. Oops, for v and add u. Remember, this is the standard way of iterating through all the edges of the graph. Just iterate through all of the nodes, and for each node, iterate through its entire JCC list. So this will go through all possible edges. Now inside here, we know there's an edge from u to v, so that contributes 1 to the n degree of v. The n degree of E goes up by 1 because of this edge from U. That's it. So at the end of this loop, we've got all the in degrees calculated. To get things started, for your very first semester, you'll just want to find all the nodes that, that already have in degree 0. Those are like the courses that have no prerequisites whatsoever. And that's going to be your first semester. In general, the way I chose to organize this loop is that I have a variable called next semester that represents the courses I know I'm going to take next semester. Then at the top of the loop, I'll say, aha, it's a new semester, so I'll change next semester into this semester. And as I go through my courses this semester, I'll see which things I'm going to take the next semester and get, get ready for the next iteration of the loop. I'm saying this because I'm going to call it next semester. Even though this, this is going to be the very first semester, I think of it, you know, before before I even go to college, I form my next semester list, which is actually going to be my very first semester list. It's going to be everything that has no prerequisites. So how do I grab a list of all the node indices that don't have any, that have in degree zero? Perfect job for a list comprehension. You could do it with just a loop, you know, looping through all the nodes, check if the in degree is zero, then tack it on to the end of this next semester list. You could do that, but list comprehension is exactly Python's tool for streamlining this. 